Welcome. I'm grateful to see you here and really excited about uh, today. I'm thankful to um, that you'll, you'll have the opportunity to get to know somebody that I have come to know over the last uh, year and uh, come to appreciate as one of our terrific uh, alumni. It's my pleasure today to introduce Sharla Smith-Hales of the class of 1986, who is the 2017 recipient of the Alumni Achievement Award for the J. Reuben Clark Law School. My introductory remarks will draw uh, heavily on the nomination we received from uh, one of her classmates, Kurt Naylor. Several years before Charlotte started law school, her parents were killed in a small plane crash. Her younger siblings were then cared for by extended family, but Charlotte and her husband, Jim, who's also here, came to realize that the children, who then ranged from ages four to 14, needed a change in circumstance and petitioned to become their guardians. They were granted guardianship, and while they had been married only a short time, Sharla and Jim became the primary caregivers for these children. Sharla took off a year from law school to make this, this transition the best for the children and joined Jim uh, to finish, so that they both finished law school uh, at BYU in 1986. Sharla took coursework during law school to focus on her interest in education, which laid the groundwork for her home achievements and professional career. Within a few weeks of welcoming the three siblings into their, uh, into their home, Charlotte's sister, who was just younger and attending BYU at the time, suffered a paralyzing accident on a water slide. She left the hospital and during the next year lived with Jim and Sharla while she rehabilitated from the accident. Even with her personal and family commitments, Sharla graduated from the J. Rubin Clark Law School with her JD, summa cum laude. As Sharla and her husband raised her siblings and their own four children, Charlotte was primarily a stay-at-home mom. However, as opportunities were made available, she provided occasional independent contract research to her husband and other attorneys. And during that time, she served in many church callings, including Young Women President, Relief Society President, Stake Young Women President. Her interest in education blossomed while at the law school, and she took courses in education law, children in the law, and administrative law, knowing that one day, if the opportunity presented itself, she would like to work in support of educating children. In 2002, Charlotte ran for an open seat on the Douglas County, Nevada School Board, a district with responsibility for about 5,000 students. She held the seat for 12 years until term limited, serving as the board president three times. She was heavily involved with the Nevada Association of School Boards, the NASB, a statewide nonprofit association dedicated to advancing public education throughout Nevada. She served as president of that association for a year, and in 2006, she was voted Officer of the Year for the NASB. In 2009, she was given the Executive Director's Award for Contributions to the Nevada School Boards and the Association, and in 2011, she was named as the NASB Individual School Board Member of the Year. She continues to provide professional training to members of the NASB. In 2008, while in the middle of a seven-year stint teaching early morning seminary, I managed only one year of that while I was in Wisconsin and resigned. Uh, when I was, I was told it was a job, not a calling, so I felt okay about that. Um, <laughs> Sharla accepted the position as general counsel for the Churchill County School District, a neighboring Nevada school district, and continues to work in that professional capacity. When Charlotte turned out of her position on the local school board, she accepted a position with the Douglas County Family Support Council, a nonprofit organization that supports women generally, including victims of domestic violence. In 2015 and 16, she served as president of the council. Currently, Charlotte serves as director of the Public Affairs Council for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for the Reno Coordinating Council. Her responsibilities in that calling include assisting the 10 stake presidents in the Coordinating Council with public affairs matters of concern to the LDS Church. In nominating Charlotte for this award, Kurt Naylor wrote, Charlotte may not be one of those alumni who are in the public eye, but her dedicated service and example to the, in the community, BYU, legal field, home, and church qualify her to receive this most deserving recognition. Charlotte is accompanied today by her husband, Jim, and um, as I mentioned, who's also an alumnus of the law school, uh, two of their children and other family members and friends, and we welcome the Hales family back to the law school. I'm very much looking forward to Charlotte's remarks, which she has entitled, Greatest in the Law, Choosing to Love in Life and Career. 
Sharla, thank you for your terrific example. <laughs> What an incredible honor it is to be here. <clears throat> I want to thank Dean Smith and anyone else who's responsible for this opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank you students for your good work, for your good work now and in the future and for the excellence that you will reflect on our alma mater. I want to thank my husband for his support and his partnership. Truly every achievement of mine is really an achievement of ours, for which he equally deserves recognition. I want to thank our children and other friends for the support over the years, for the support right now, for being here, and for those who are supporting from afar. This award has been both joyous and very humbling, and it has caused me a good deal of productive introspection. When I was a student here, we didn't have nearly as many speakers as you do, and that's a great opportunity. But I know how tight your schedules are, and so I really was wondering, why would anyone come hear me speak? So I asked our daughter-in-law, Jenny, who graduated from here in 2015, and her answer was super quick. It was, it's the free lunch. <laughs> Actually, that made me feel better, because I knew at least out of this time together you'd get lunch. And I thought, maybe the only thing in shorter demand than time for you is money. So whatever reason you're here, I really, really thank you for, for being here. My husband and I live in a small town in the eastern foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. We do some road biking. Our favorite ride is a loop near our home that's about 22 miles long. We see way more cows than cars when we're riding this loop and that's one of the perks of small town life. The interesting thing about riding the loop is that the perspective and the experience of the ride varies dramatically depending on whether we're riding clockwise or counterclockwise, even though it's the same journey. It's the same elevation gain and lost, the same starting and ending place. Starting the loop in a westward direction, the vista includes a river. It includes farms, barns, all with a really beautiful, majestic mountain backdrop. In stark contrast, when we are riding that very same stretch of road in an eastward direction, that's not it, that's still westward. <laughs> eastward, there's very little vegetation because of the angle and the perspective, just from the direction. There's some dilapidated buildings that we see. There's an oddly edited traffic sign. And literally, lots of piles of junk. Using this bike loop as an analogy for the journey through life and career, how can a person keep a perspective of the beautiful, the appealing, and the enjoyable? How can a person avoid dwelling on the junk heaps and the unsightly things, thus making the ride more enjoyable. I want to share with you today my best thoughts and some experiences that help answer those questions. So I graduated in 1986, and then I passed the Nevada Bar in 1987, and for the next 20 years, I practiced very little law. Some years, none at all. Some years, just a few hours a week working research and writing for other attorneys. I completely enjoyed being a mostly stay-at-home mom, but I looked forward to having a legal career when the time was right. So as you heard, in 2003, I started a 12-year stand on a school board, and that was very satisfying because I believe so strongly in education. In the summer of 2006, 20 years after I graduated, I felt the time was right to start working on a legal career. Our youngest child was starting middle school. I felt I could start at least a part-time job with minimal impact on the family. If I organized everything just right, it would all work out, and I was excited for a new venture. 
Then I got a phone call from a high counselor in our stake. And now, I don't know how many are not LDS, but I'm gonna just say a stake is a, con is a, a group of local congregations. So this high counselor was assigned to seminary, which is a daily religious class for high school students. And in our area, it happens before school, so very early. In the days leading up to the meeting, I feared, <laughs> I dreaded, I agonized. I hoped it wasn't what I thought it was, but it was. I have to admit I was not gracious to the high counselor, and in fact, I made him come back a second time. I guess I was hoping that the inspiration would change, but it didn't. I don't know everything about what it means to love God with all your might, mind, and strength, but I'm pretty sure it means that when you're asked to teach seminary and you reasonably can, you do. So <clears throat> conforming my plans to those from a higher source was a painful process. I expected the hours required to teach seminary and to do a good job of it would eliminate for me any possibility of working in the law. With concerted effort, I worked on my attitude and accepted the calling. Teaching seminary turned out to bless my life in profound and numerous ways. And contrary to my fears, my life didn't end when I started teaching seminary. Six months into it, I found I had hit my stride. That February, I was attending a national school boards conference in a huge convention center, and I was riding up a two-story long escalator, and I heard a faint voice calling my name. And I looked over at the down escalator, and I saw a school board member from a neighboring school district, and he was yelling, wait for me at the top. So I watch, and he goes down and runs up and comes up the, the up escalator, and when he gets to the top, he informs me that their general counsel has just walked out, essentially, after many years on the job, and that they would be requesting proposals, and he urged me to submit a proposal. So I did, and a few months later, I found myself with a legal career. I know that Dean Smith has encouraged you to co-create a path with God. I am thankful that God waited <laughs> while I caught up as he helped me create my path. My work allows me to represent a cause I believe in, which is a far more enjoyable ride than just working for a paycheck. I have nearly complete flexibility working as an independent contractor so that I can spend time with family and friends and with service. There are many law school alumni with more visible and prestigious careers than mine, but success comes in many different packages and I am very grateful and very happy with mine. The position I have has been perfect for me, vastly superior to any that I was considering the previous summer, proving that God will make more of you than you will make of yourself if you will turn your life to him. And that sometimes, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all things will be added later, is sometimes literal. President Uchtdorf provided a contemporary iteration of that principle. The two great commandments are the target. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. As we accept this, all other good things will fall into place. Of course, these two commandments come from Christ, who was asked by a lawyer, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. From what I found on your schedule online, your last day of classes for this semester is a week from tomorrow, and you start finals in 12 days. You have heavy concerns. One else might be hoping for excellent grades, maybe just even passing grades. Two L's along with grades are worried about summer placement. Three L's are anxious for jobs. The first job out of law school is seeming to lay the foundation for careers. Perhaps you worry about how to balance school, family, church, and maybe work. Perhaps you worry that you've somehow ended up in the wrong place, 
that maybe law school is not for you. I say to all of you, you are in the right place. Law school will bless you all your life and will bless others in your life as well. You will be fine. Everything will work out. You will be a success. Whatever your grades might be, you will find jobs. Your journey through life and career will have unexpected turns. You can't see the end or even the middle from the beginning. But every turn will have wonderful views when you have love of God and love of your neighbor. And you will have a scenic, beautiful ride. The second great commandment requires that we love others, even our enemies and those who are not good to us. This commandment doesn't require a warm, cute puppy affection for those who are in positions adverse to us, but it does require a feeling of charity for all. The Bible Dictionary defines charity as the highest, noblest, strongest kind of love, not merely affection. Charity is the pure love of Christ. That of in that phrase is powerful. It encompasses love for Christ and love from, from Christ and love like Christ's. When we struggle to find love for others, we can borrow some of his. Sister Neil F. Marriott explained, the Savior's atonement is a conduit for the constant flow of charity from our Father in heaven. Charity requires, as Elder L. Whitney Clayton described, that our actions as attorneys be drenched with the spirit of genuine Christian goodness. Charity means we do, we do good to those who hate us. We pray for those who despitefully use us. Oops. Before practicing law, I used to wonder, who would ever despitefully use me? But now I know. Some years ago, the school district I represent had a teacher with a long discipline history for significant mistreatment of students, mostly involving anger management problems and use of racial slurs. The district determined that under the collective bargaining agreement, he had had enough chances. The requirements of progressive discipline were met and he would be discharged. The teachers association disagreed. The matter went to arbitration. I had heard that opposing counsel was difficult to work with, and I thought I had steeled myself for his shenanigans, but nothing prepared me for what I encountered at the arbitration hearing. Arbitrations aren't like trials where the parties and their attorneys and the judge are separated by several feet. At arbitration hearings, you're all sitting around the same table. At this hearing, I was very, very well prepared on the facts, on the legal analysis, on my arguments, and on my advocacy. But I was not prepared for the blatant hostility in the form of personal attacks against me, <clears throat> sarcasm, denigration of my client that spewed from opposing counsel. He muttered, uh, he even told sexist jokes while we were on break to the arbitrator. He muttered under his breath while I was presenting my case, things like, this is so boring. And that's just stupid. And I can't believe she's saying that. I was thrown off my game the entire two-day arbitration. I was a little nauseous. I was shaky. And I seriously disliked opposing counsel. <laughs> Figuratively, my views during the arbitration were the equivalent of rocky, rusty, weedy junk heaps. I like to think that I was still able to fully put on my case and that the result would not have been different without opposing counsel's bad behavior and my inadequate response. The decision of the arbitrator, the teacher would be reinstated, but without back pay for the six months between the initial dismissal and the reinstatement. This decision was as close to a win for the district as we could get but it was still a loss. The teacher would be back in the classroom. Habits are hard to break though. And within months, there was yet another instance of misconduct by this teacher, despite the district's efforts to support him. There was another dismissal from employment. There was another arbitration. I found myself 
preparing again. It was deja vu. Same room, same teacher, same type of misconduct, same opposing counsel. It's rare to get a do-over like this, and while I dreaded it, I was happy for the chance to try and do a better job than I'd done before, to figure out how to do it. This time I knew I had to prepare not just for the case, but also for the opposing counsel. I conferred with mentors and learned tips for dealing with difficult attorneys. For instance, I could stop the presentation of my case and state, the record should reflect that opposing counsel is muttering derogatory comments. Or the re record should reflect that opposing counsel's gestures are distracting the witness. I also talked to a few people who had worked with opposing counsel. I learned some things about him, including that he had been through a bitter divorce. That and other experiences must have changed his direction of travel in life so that he had very unpleasant views of his own. I began to feel a little compassion. The week before arbitration round two, my best mentor, my husband, suggested I go see this man, look him in the eye and tell him my expectations for his appropriate behavior. Could I put myself in harm's way like that? Could I voluntarily walk into the lion's den? As repulsive as this sounded, there was a principle involved that rang true. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. Dean Smith explained this principle in a different way. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we should encourage people to change and improve. If we believe that others have taken a wrong turn, one of the greatest acts of charity that we can perform is to give them room to repent. So I went to the office of opposing counsel, sat down with him, and first discussed a few things like exhibits and such. Then I looked him square in the eye, called him by name, and called him out on his bad behavior. I was hoping to say something incredibly profound and powerful, but instead I just simply told the truth. It's not okay for you to mutter criticisms or make demeaning comments or tell sexist jokes. If you do, I will call you out on the record. He gave a weak denial, our talk was over, and I left. A week later, I found myself at the arbitration hearing taking the same journey over the same stretch of road I had already traveled but this time my view was in the other direction. My dislike and fear of this man had become compassion and charity. His behavior was improved. The demeaning comments and distracting gestures were gone. He still made overstatements like, she doesn't have a shred of evidence. However, this time I saw them for what they were, bluffing tactics, attempts to present for his client, and statements that he felt he had to make because he really did not have the facts on his side. I had confidence and understanding and enjoyed the work. My view was vastly more pleasant and my journey enjoyable regardless of the result. Although I am happy to say <laughs> the story ends with a decision for the school district and the teacher was dismissed. Maintaining charity won't always change others' bad behavior, but it will allow you to feel good about yourself. Maintaining charity for difficult opposing counsel or others includes giving them the benefit of the doubt, refusing to take offense, and allowing them room to improve. It does not mean being a pushover or weak. Good attorneys must be assertive, even aggressive at times. Good attorneys must be out of the box, thinkers, they must be smart and strong. Charitable thoughts and Christian actions require thorough preparation, strong analysis, and concerted self-discipline. Those extra efforts bring greater understanding, which leads to advocacy from positions of strength without resorting to hostilities, hyperbole, or harshness. 
Interestingly, charitable understanding and Christian goodness often result in more effective representation than stooping to less noble thoughts and actions. In the school district I represent, a group of special education students alleged to a principal that one of their teachers treated them with impatience, used derogatory words against them, and of all things, locked them out of the classroom. An investigation ensued, but the results were inconclusive. There was no misconduct proven. Nonetheless, the students and their parents wanted a different teacher. The principal was convinced that the teacher was ineffective in that classroom, as was the superintendent. But under the collective bargaining agreement, the district did not have grounds for a forced transfer. The superintendent and I met with this teacher to explain to him the results of the investigation. And before our meeting, the superintendent mentioned to me that the district had a recent opening for a one-on-one -on -one position for a special ed teacher with a severely disabled student. That's a position that many would find less desirable than the, the position the teacher currently held. By happenstance, I had just attended a J. Ruben Clark Law Society continuing legal ed class taught by Russell Wood on relational communication. We learned about not one-upping, listening carefully, asking effective questions, making supportive statements and avoiding relational conflict, all very compatible with charitable thoughts and Christian actions. So when we went into the meeting with this teacher, I determined to listen. So I used phrases like, it sounds like, and so you mean, also, tell us more about that. And then the one that is incredibly effective that you would never guess is when you don't say anything at all, you just nod your head and go, hmm. And then they just keep talking. <laughs> the more he talked, the more the teacher became aware that he was not enjoying his class and that his teaching was not effective for his students. The more he talked, the more both he and we understood the challenges in his classroom. I found myself using fewer deliberate listening strategies, and more natural feelings of compassion and interest. I appreciated the struggles that, these, that he had with these students with difficult behavior. Prior to the meeting, I saw him as a teacher unable to control his classroom. During the meeting, I saw his strengths, genuine concern for students, gentleness, and a real compassion for people with disabilities. My perspective changed. Instead of a problem teacher, I saw a teacher who had strengths the, districts was, the district was not utilizing. As he talked more and we listened more, we all came to understand he was not in the right placement. Still, the district did not have the right to force a transfer and I did not see my way clear how to make that happen. Then the solution presented itself. He said, I think I'd like a transfer. So the superintendent and I paused, poker faced. I asked the teacher to excuse us so we could go confer on whether there were any openings. <laughs> we diplomatically went into the other room and closed the door and high-fived. <laughs> Genuine, compassionate listening took us to a win-win where our rights under the contract never could have taken us that day. My view on my metaf metaphorical ride at work was breathtaking. It's incredibly satisfying helping my clients solve problems because I know that ultimately, I'm helping children learn and achieve and become ready to be successful in life. That day reinforced what I have found true many times. When I choose to view others through a lens of charity, I find I am surrounded by people who generally want to do good in the world, who want to be fair and reasonable, who want to treat me well. When I see them as good people and I treat them that way, they usually respond in kind. I have a beautiful, beautiful view of the world when I do this. As I close, I turn to you, law students, and ask, 
What is your view right now in law school? What have you set your sights on? Many internships and job postings describe the su successful applicant as one in the top 10% of the class. Using this as a competitive viewpoint, it would be easy to lose the lens of charity as you interact with your classmates. It would be easy to see them as your challenge when in fact they are not your challenge, they are your resource. Your real challenge is mastering the skills and knowledge required to be a successful attorney. If placing in the top 10% is your goal, you will be sacrificing for a meaningless thing, which if obtained may or may not help you on your path. If instead you set your sights at doing your best, you'll be aiming for something much more meaningful, more within your control, and actually more challenging. My friend and your 1L classmate, Erin Craner, pointed out to me that we often hear the phrase, just do your best. While this is helpful in suggesting a focus on efforts and not results that you can't control, it's misleading because ultimately there's nothing just about doing your best. Doing your best is ultimately the highest standard that there is and much more meaningful than the top 10%. The beautiful truth is that to do your best, you must see your classmates as resources whose ideas and support are important for you individually to succeed and also for the law school to achieve the vision as described once by Dean Smith like this. Let's see. Hmm. It's not wanting to advance, so I'll just read you this. <laughs> Oh, that's right. <laughs> like this. He said, and listen for the focus on ideas. We aspire to create ideas and develop students who influence people and events for good. We succeed when our ideas inspire action and when our students use their legal education to improve their families, communities, and profession. An acquaintance of mine told me about a law school classmate who twice in quick succession was unprepared when called on in class. The impulse among this classmate's peers was to avoid him like poison. My acquaintance telling me this account, who may or may not be my husband, <laughs> to this day regrets not reaching out in support to that classmate. Jim realizes no one comes to class twice unprepared unless there are serious challenges in life. And I am happy to say that this person did very well in law school. If you see your classmates as competitors for a limited supply of successful positions, you'll be surrounded by people pushing you out of the way for success. You'll spend your law school years surrounded by self-centered, greedy people. On the other hand, if you determine to view your classmates through a lens of charity, you'll be surrounded by caring, kind, supportive people with remarkable ideas and insights who can help you be successful. Give your classmates the benefit of the doubt. Refuse to take offense. Attribute negative actions not to hostility or criticism, but to some other reasonable explanation. Resist the urge to label your classmates. Then your classmates will help you do your best. Rather than elbowing for limited positions, you will share a common goal, mastering unlimited skills and knowledge important for success, whatever package success may come in for you. You will all be traveling in the same direction and that direction will have a spectacular view. May you move forward with the love of God and your neighbor. May you have charity for your classmates and for the attorneys you will work with and against. 
thereby building enjoyable, enriching relationships. May you be blessed as you create with God beautiful panoramas in your personal and professional lives. Thank you. So we have some time for questions, and if you'd like to ask a question, uh, Vance Everett has a microphone, and we'd like you to speak into that so the re recording can get it, but I'll invite Charlotte back. I thought of a question I would have if I was you. <laughs> Why didn't the arbitrator step in when that attorney was behaving so poorly? And I can answer that. I don't know. And in fact, at the beginning of the second day, I appealed to him in the most professional manner I knew how. And when he seemed unwilling to respond, I felt that to push it any farther would not be in my client's favor. So I just tried to ignore and push, push through. And I think that um, we're, we're getting to a world where that would be less and less possible. But not quite there yet. Yeah. Any, any questions? Uh, not since the second arbitration, but um, I'm very comfortable. Yeah. I think I could. I know I could. Yeah. And, you know, the nice thing is I'd be a lot more confident. Did you find it difficult coming back into the workforce after being a mother for 20 plus years? Um, short answer, yes. Uh, my husband is really a hero. And I worked really hard. The first um, several months I worked really, really hard. But then it got easier and the other key is mentors, mentors. I have two friends who uh, are attorneys who early on when I started working just really said to me, call me anytime. And, and I have, and it, what's, what's, what's so fantastic is if I have an issue, and it happens less and less, but if I had an issue that I, I researched and I thought about and I, I couldn't quite put my finger on the answer, um, I could call them, and within a minute, I would know, I, I would see the clarity that I had lacked before. And it, that was satisfying to them and so helpful to me. And the, the beautiful thing is it, it didn't happen very often, but knowing I could do that was really, really wonderful. And so I guess the lesson is, and this is something I've tried to do, to be a mentor is incredibly satisfying. So. I am big on mentors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'm glad you asked that question. It was incredibly helpful in a lot of ways. One, just critical thinking skills are always helpful. And uh, I was the only attorney on that school board, so it was helpful to bring uh, legal analysis is to many different kinds of conversations. And this isn't, doesn't quite answer your question, but um, the reason I was able to become an attorney for a school district is that I had watched carefully for several years what the attorneys in our district did, and I just learned so much doing that. Um, so does that answer? Yeah, okay. So my question kind of goes along with the first question. Um, for those of us who are planning on spending some time at home with kids for a little bit, are there any things that you would suggest doing during that time to kind of stay involved in the law to make that transition easier when you go back out? Well, f well, for me, those times when I just did research and writing, it just kept those skills somewhat current and it was enjoyable. So I would say when you're able to, to even do four or five hours a week, is when you can, is helpful. 
And continuing legal education classes are, are great. And so staying up with those, even on the, in the years when you're not practicing full time, is really helpful. And now it's easier and easier to do because there's so many that are just online. Yeah. How did I do preparation for the bar with kids at home? Well, that is a really great question, and I'll answer it in two parts because we graduated together in 1986, and my husband took the bar in 86, and I took it in 87. So that's my first answer. We didn't take it together. And um, uh, I, I just scheduled time on the calendar. And Jim knew that was his time with the kids. And I just left and went and took a, a, a review course. And I was of the um, approach that I was only going to take the bar once, and I was going to pass. And so I overstudied. And I highly recommend that approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. How does somebody other than having been a good relationship or end up working here? Well, um, in, in the district I represent, um, I'm the only one there. So. That explains that. Um, in, in a lot of districts, employment law firms somehow, at least in the state of Nevada, get connected to, to sc representing school districts. A lot of it is employment law. But there's a lot of other things. Student issues, constitutional issues are fascinating in education law. Um, a lot of school districts have in-house counsel, bigger school districts. Only two districts in Nevada are of that size. but. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, I think that a lot of attorneys feel like um, they, can, they can pick things up, the th pieces they don't know they can pick up. And that is one thing about working for a school district that's really enjoyable, is there's a broad, really broad variety of work from contracts to constitutional law to, you know, uh, workers' comp, all kinds of things that, that you, you know, nobody is a specialist in everything that a school district needs represented on. So you just learn as you go and you, you know when to call your mentors and you, you know, can figure it out. Yeah. Well, you guys have been a really, really wonderful group to talk to, so thank you so much for having me.